Good afternoon. Um, we are very happy to welcome you at uh, uh, welcome you all uh, to the second uh, webinar of a series of three uh, that we are organizing on plant pest surveys um, organized uh, by uh, the European Food Safety Authority in the context of the International Year of Plant Health. So, Dr. Elena Lazzaro and myself will guide you through this webinar. Elena, by training, is a biostatistician. She has done her PhD research in statistics and optimization. Currently, she is a researcher at the Valencian Institute for Agricultural Research, IVIA, in Spain. And she is a member in the EFSA Expert Working Group on Pest Surveys. Uh, I am Sibron Foss, agronomist, specialized in agricultural engineering and working in EFSA Plant Health since 2008. Currently, I'm coordinating the plant pest survey activities in EFSA. I will guide you through the introduction of the toolkit EFSA has prepared for assisting member states in the survey activities. And after, Dr. Elena Lazaro will deliver the presentation on the detection surveys. So we can get started with the presentation. Welcome again. So before we enter into the topic, I wanted, uh, first of all, to indicate that this webinar is being recorded. Um, it will be held in, or it is held in English. And also, we would appreciate your questions to be submitted in English through the platform. Um, to communicate with us, you will have to use the two chat boxes. Uh, in case you have some issues with the sound, you can also adjust the speaker volume. This is the screen that you can see on, uh, on your computers. And uh, as you can see, there, is, there are two chat boxes. Uh, the, under chat, the, the, the chat box that is at the lower part of the screen is uh, dedicated to expressing your uh, technical issues and, and to get some assistance and support on technical issues you might encounter during the webinar. Um, instead, the box that is at the right is, uh, is uh, the, the place, the correct place to uh, raise uh, any uh, issues related to the topic and any uh, questions you might have on the topic. You can as well enlarge the screen by clicking on the full screen icon here. Um, due to COVID situation, it's uh, 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 unfortunate that we have to uh, held this type of events in the form of webinars. Uh, and uh, we apologize in advance in case you would meet any technical issues in the course of this webinar. So today's webinar is uh, uh, organized around the detection surveys. Uh, and we will present to you the, the, the practical and statistical framework that uh, we have prepared for uh, risk-based surveillance. So let's start with the mandate. So back in 2017, uh, uh, we received the mandate from the European Commission to facilitate and support member states in the planning and execution of their survey activities. And this uh, uh, request was, uh, is, uh, was developed in the context of the uh, new EU regulatory framework uh, towards more prevention, risk targeting and statistics. Uh, I am talking about the new plant health uh, law, the implementing and delegated acts, as well as the, uh, the, the, the regulation on the co-financing of the survey activity. Also, this work is being developed in the, in, the, in the context of the IPPC standards, so the International Plant Protection Convention uh, standards. And in particular, uh, I am uh, talking about the ISPM 6 on surveillance and the International Standard for Phytosanitary, uh, Phytosanitary Measures number 31 that is dealing with the methodology for sampling consignment. Uh, there are as well a, a, a whole list of ISPMs that are indicated in this slide. And these ones are more procedurals and, pro, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, documents that define uh, protocols for uh, uh, international protocols for plant health. And we are also uh, uh, in line with these different procedures and referring to them whenever it is uh, necessary. In this context, we can define three different types of surveys, the detection surveys, the delimiting surveys, and the monitoring surveys. 
Our mandate, though, is focusing on detection surveys and delimiting surveys, as well as our presentation today that will focus mainly on detection surveys. Just to introduce, uh, uh, I would like to show you this uh, graph that shows that after a pass is introduced, um, after a pest is introduced, um, the, the, it establishes a founder population that expands. And the pest prevalence increases over time. And in general, we can distinguish three phases. A first phase, that is the lag phase of this uh, expansion of uh, pest prevalence or increase of pest prevalence. Um, this lag phase is just after introduction of the pest. A second phase is the exponential growth phase, uh, during which land managers are uh, uh, suffering from the pest already, are already suffering from some uh, impact. Farmers might also already alarm the authorities about the pest, and general public is getting aware about the issue. Uh, after that, a plateau is reached. A plateau is reached, and this plateau uh, corresponds to the carrying capacity of the receiving environment for the pest. And uh, uh, it is important to mention that the earlier the detection is done, meaning the closer to the moment of introduction, uh, the more chances we will have to prevent and eradicate the pest. And uh, um, yes, so and and also it shows on the on on, on the, the right side of this chart of this graph, it shows that the cost as the pest population, the pest prevalence increases, the cost for controlling, for eradicating uh, uh, are increasing. In other words, we can somehow conclude based on this chart that the detection is cheap compared to control and eradication. So the survey toolkit that we have prepared um, is a, a toolkit that is uh, 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 prepared to assist the member states from the survey preparation to the survey design. And um, it is in particular uh, developed for the quarantine pass. It, pro it provides tools to support uh, 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 to, yes, it provides the tools to support the member states in the execution and in the planning also of the of the survey. So for the survey uh, preparation, um, the tools that are, are prepared address basically the four questions that are in green on this on this uh, slide. So what are we looking for? The pest itself, the taxonomy, the life stages have to be clearly described and characterized. When do we have to look for the pest? This is also linked to the life cycle of the pest and it is linked to the life stages that we want to target by the survey. Where do we have to look for the pest? And this where we have to look for the pest, in fact, includes uh, uh, the host plant identification, a clear choice of the host plants that we want to target by the survey. It also has to consider the environmental suitability in terms of the suitable climate and the host plant availability and host plant distribution in the member state. Also, where should be addressed by looking at the pathways of introduction and uh, the different nodes that can have that we can have along a pathway, but also the endpoints of the pathway are very important uh, 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 elements to address when trying to address the question where we should look for the best. And uh, in the survey preparation, the last question that we address is how should we look for the best? So. We, we try to provide information on the different detection methods that are available and trying to indicate which are the most recommended ones. So uh, it is important to, to, to consider that these four questions are to be asked before conducting any survey independently from the methodology that is going to be used. Now, the particularity of the, of the, the framework that EFSA is proposing is that it is proposing an, an, an aspect that uh, uh, it is proposing an answer to the question how much should we survey? How much should we survey to uh, uh, detect the pest? What is the survey effort that is required? And for answering that question, we have this methodological framework uh, for which a number of tools have been developed. 
So uh, let's go to the outputs that are linked to the survey preparation. So the objectives uh, of the best survey cards and story maps that are uh, for the survey preparations are to guide the surveyor through the gathering of the relevant information that is required for the survey design. And basically, it is addressing these four questions that I've already mentioned earlier. So all the survey cards and the story maps are uh, uh, following the same structure. So they all address in one section the PES and its biology with a whole series of uh, subsections. It also addresses a main, uh, uh, as a main section the detection and the identification methods for the PES. And at the end, it concludes on the key elements for survey design that are required reflections to be made uh, before embarking into a survey design. So, so far, we have 43 survey cards that have been prepared and published, and, and they are available in the EFSA journal, uh, EFSA journal, in the virtual issue of the EFSA journal, dedicated to the toolkit for plant pest surveillance in the EU. These 43 survey, pest survey cards address 63 pests, uh, among which we have uh, uh, three pilot organisms, Xylella fastidiosa philocita citricarpa and agrilus planipenis, we also have a whole series of citrus pests, forest pests, potato pests, and other pests. And as I said before, we have not only pest survey cards, we also have story maps. And these story maps, there are 29 that are available. So what are the story maps? Story maps are the latest update of the survey cards. Whenever there is a relevant information that has to be updated, linked to the surveillance, relevant for the surveillance, in terms of regulation, in terms of knowledge of the biology of the pest, in terms of, of information on the detection methods, then it is uh, important that we can update these documents. And instead of updating the uh, traditional uh, PDF format and the, the pest survey cards, we preferred to uh, propose a more interactive tool and a more interactive platform for this work. So um, these uh, survey cards, uh, updated in the form of story maps are more interactive, they are more visual, and they can be defined as sort of pocket survey cards. There is a video that is available in the EFSA YouTube channel where you can uh, get more information on how to use them, how to consult them, and what are the principles behind them. So all these uh, story maps are available in a story maps gallery that I invite you to consult. So these were the two uh, tools that we have for the survey preparation, basically. And now let's go to the survey design. So the main objective of the survey design is uh, to estimate the survey for effort that is needed to detect the pest, um, to provide evidence of, for pest freedom. And this is important for reassuring our trade partners. And it is also very relevant to improve a timely detection and uh, uh, potential eradication, as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. So in the methodology that we are proposing, the first step is to translate the answers that we have gathered in the survey preparation, the four answers to the, 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 answers to the four questions addressed in the PEST survey card. Um, uh, the idea is to try to translate them in terms of survey parameters that need to be set, indicating the assumptions that are made for each one of them. So first of all, the target population has to be, has to be defined in terms of, uh, of uh, its structure and its size. Uh, and of course, the, to define the target population, so the host plant population that is targeted by the survey, it is important to involve uh, uh, both the inspectors and scientists because they might have the knowledge of the landscape, they might have the knowledge of the potential establishment and of the med modeling activities that help to characterize the target population. Also, the detection method should be characterized by addressing the earlier questions that I mentioned. And um, the detection method for us in, in term for the surveillance is basically characterized by the method sensitivity. The method sensitivity um, in other words, is the probability uh, to, to detect the pest when the pest is present. And uh, this information 
uh, should be uh, uh, gathered and should be uh, um, interpreted involving inspectors, uh, laboratory technicians and scientists. The last type of survey parameters that are required uh, it is, are the aims of the survey. So the aims of the survey have to be defined a priori before conducting a survey. They are, in other words, setting the proxy of the absence we want to demonstrate. Or even they, can, they are uh, uh, um, corresponding to the level of the pest that we can live with. So this has to be defined. And this is characterized by the design prevalence and the confidence level. The design prevalence is the prevalence of the pest above which we want to detect it. And the confidence is the confidence we want to achieve in the overall survey. These two parameters are set mainly uh, by the risk managers by the, uh, with the help uh, of scientists as they reflect clearly the compromise that is taken between the available resources and the acceptable level of the risk. Then, in the, after, after, after these survey parameters are set, um, it is possible to estimate the survey effort in a statistically sound and a risk-based survey design using the tool that we made available for it that is called Ribes Plus. The outputs of Ribes Plus will be the numbers of inspections, the numbers of samples, or the numbers of tests that are necessary to co infer conclusions on the entire population. And the different uh, documents and tools that we have developed to, uh, uh, to address this uh, uh, methodological framework that I have just very briefly described are uh, mainly guideline documents. So we have four guideline documents. The general guidelines uh, for statistically sound and risk-based surveys of plant health that are that is published already in the uh, that has been published earlier this year uh, in the in the toolkit for uh, plant pest surveys uh, indicates the context in which the surveillance is conducted. It also gives all the principles and background, mathematical background of the survey design following this methodological framework. Then there are three specific guidelines for pilot organisms. The guidelines for uh, Xylella fastidiosa, for Philocyta citricarpa, and the ones for Agrilus planipenis are pending publication. These ones are more an application of the approach. They uh, are an illustration on how to set the survey parameters, how to conduct some, uh, we, we conduct some simulations to, to demonstrate how the system works and how to estimate the survey efforts in different scenarios. It also addresses allocation of the efforts in a, of the effort, the survey efforts that have been estimated, yes, the allocation of survey efforts that have been estimated in the survey area. And last but and not least, uh, it also indicates how you can conclude on such survey design using this methodology. In addition to these four guideline documents, there is a statistical tool, Ribes Plus. But now you will hear much more about this in the next uh, uh, talk that will be held by uh, Elena Lazzaro, and she is going to go into the topic of the detection surveys. Before I... Uh, uh, we had foreseen a question and answer session, but no questions were raised by the audience. So we suggest to continue. Good afternoon for everyone. I'm Elena Lazaro, and I will guide the second part of this webinar. The idea in this part is to provide some insights about the methodological and mildly practical considerations that are important for designing a statistical risk-based detection survey. As Sivran uh, told before, under the Commission request, EFSA has developed a specific guidelines for the survey of free pilot organisms and also a, a general guideline considering a statistical risk-based methods. In these guidelines, have been addressed two different types of survey, detection surveys and the limiting surveys. But today, we will focus on detection surveys for the limiting survey, the next webinar. So detection surveys, as you can see on the slide, 
are, are addressed to answer the following key question. Is the best known to occur in our Sub Bay area? So to answer these questions, we propose the design of a statistical survey with the aim to estimate the survey force that we have to reach in order to answer the key question with certain evidence. The key question, don't forget it, please. So we will use previous tool to estimate this survey support. However, we have to introduce uh, in the tool some information about the best characteristics, the survey area, and also the evidence that we got to achieve in our survey conclusions. This relevant information is introduced uh, within the, the reverse tool uh, by means of the survey parameters that are the target population, the method sensitivity, and the design prevalence and the confidence level. Um, as I said before, uh, method sensitivity is a survey parameter and also an input of rivers. Uh, method sensitivity is directly related with the detection and identification method. Um, it reflects uh, the sensitivity of all the methods that we use to detect and identify the, the, the pathogen or the pest from the field to the lab. It can be interpreted as the probability to detect the pest if an individual inspection unit uh, if it is present. And method sensitivity combines uh, inspection, sampling, or trapping effectiveness with diagnostic sensitivity. Um, inspection, trapping, and sampling effectiveness it reflects the effectiveness of the methods that we use in the field. And diagnostic sensitivity reflects the sensitivity of the methods that we use in the lab. Only just to illustrate the, the meaning of the method sensitivity, for instance, for Thilocyta citricarpa, the causal agent of citrus ductless blood spot, from, for running the detection survey simulation, we propose to set the method sensitivity at 0 0.8. You can find the rationing behind this value in the specific Citricarpa guidelines. Uh, as you can observe, sampling effectiveness is set at 0 0.8, uh, considering the inspection and sampling on host plants with mature fruits, because the, the fungus is detected on fruit, and also considering the sampling of symptomatic and also for asymptomatic fruits and the symptoms induction, because as you can observe, the pathogen, the pathogen, the fungus, has a long latent phase to symptom expression. And as you can observe in the graph, an estimated prevalence of visual things of 25% is related with a prevalence of, is related with an estimated uh, prevalence of infection close to 75%. Diagnostic sensitivity, Sensitivity is set as one for this specific case because the high sensitivity of the existing molecular methods to detect uh, citric acid. Target population is another survey parameter uh, that needs to be quantified and introduced in reverse to infer the survey efforts. To make more clear how to deal with this parameter quantification and, characteriz and characterization, also, we will consider the example of Philosteta citricarpa uh, detection surveys. Target population, as Sibren mentioned before, uh, needs to be defined and quantified in terms of size and structure. Size uh, means the number of inspection units, and structure uh, means how, um, accounts how these inspection units can be aggregated according to a or to a homogeneous epidemiological criteria. At that regard, we propose to divide, to divide survey area in different hierarchical levels from the home, whole territory to the inspection unit level. For Philostica citricarpa survey, we propose to split the survey area according to two land use categories, agricultural and residential, because citrus species can be formed in both. In each one, on these land use categories, um, uh, citrus species 
are structured in different ways which will influence the epidemiological unit definition and also the identification of risk factors. Uh, risk factor, don't forget it, is another survey parameter that we have to introduce in rivers. Uh, I would like to highlight that uh, risk factors are optional survey parameters because we can estimate survey efforts without considering them. But it's interesting to consider them because they allow to enforce the survey effort in those areas in which it's more likely to find uh, the pest. Obviously, the consideration has influence in the uh, estimate of the survey efforts. Um, and the definition depends on how the target population has been structured. As an example, uh, we provide a risk factor that can be used for Philostica Stricarpa detection surveys. The risk factor, as you can see, uh, is based on citrus species susceptibility. For more details and another risk factor definitions, look for the specific guidelines. Okay? So these risk factors have been defined considering three risk levels. The Vaseline level that aggregates the following citrus species and two additional levels um, um, which consider lemons and late maturing cultivars of sweet orange. As you can observe, each this level has been characterized by but its relative risk in relation to the Vaseline category. And I would like to remark that in order to use, um, introduce uh, risk factors information within rivers, we also need to estimate the proportion of, uh, of the population in which yield level applies. Only uh, just to show another example on how uh, we can deal with the target population definition and quantification. For instance, for Silella fastidiosa, we also uh, propose the subdivision of the whole survey area in different hierarchical levels. But however, I would like to, to highlight that given the, the, the wide range of host plants that are susceptible to this bacterium, for the second level, we propose the, subdiv the subdivision in four land use categories in order to better characterize epidemiological units risk and risk factors uh, better. Uh, confidence level and design prevalence are also survey parameters that are used to quantify the evidence about the survey conclusions. Obviously, they, they are uh, inputs of, of rivers. So, confidence level is the confidence we want to have on the survey and design prevalence is the prevalence we can live with. Uh, so, when we design a detection survey, in our survey conclusions, we can say something like, uh, with a given amount of confidence, uh, the prevalence is, is below uh, the chosen design prevalence. So under these assumptions, are considered and, cons and assuming that all samples have been tested negative, we have an evidence that, that our best area is, is free. So, as I said before, confidence level and design prevalence uh, has influence in the survey force estimate and also in the survey conclusion. Uh, we base our survey conclusion, we support our survey conclusion in relation to the, the quantification of these two relevant survey parameters. So um, I would like to highlight this message because I think that it's very important and not forget it. The lower the design prevalence and the higher the confidence level, the stronger the evidence for pest freedom. Uh, furthermore, the design prevalence, uh, confidence level, and method sensitivity, uh, that is the uh, other survey uh, parameter, are interrelated, as you can observe in this graph. So that for a given sample size, the design prevalence increases as the method sensitivity decreases. Um, on the other hand, for a given sample size, the achieved confidence level increases as the method sensitivity 
increase. Uh, in the previous slide, I will have explained the information that we need to uh, design a detection survey under the statistical risk-based approach. And also, we have given some practical consideration. But um, from now, the idea is to illustrate a detection survey design for Kilostrictacity Carpa in a sim considering a simplified scenario. So, our objective is to design a detection survey for Tricarpa in the Valencian province within the Valencian autonomous community. Here, uh, you can observe that we propose to divide the population in different hierarchical levels to better char characterize and quantify it. I would like to highlight uh, four issues. In the survey area, is only present of citrus in agricultural areas. We assume that the whole uh, Valencia region uh, behaves as a single epidemiological unit because the epidemiology of the fungus can be, uh, we are assuming that the epidemiology of the fungus is homogeneous within it. And also, in the survey design, according to the characteristics of the survey area, we will exploit as a risk factor, a risk factor based on citrus species susceptibility. And the special units are considered citrus uh, trees with mature fruits. As you can observe in this table, um, uh, we provide the numerical information of the target of population within our survey area. We have collected the information about the hectares that cover each uh, one of the citrus species of interest and we have quantified uh, the number of inspection units that are in the Valencia province, assuming an average number of trees per hectare of 450. Confidence level and design prevalence of the survey has been set under the premise that we want to achieve an overall confidence level for the Valencian community region of 95% to detect a prevalence a higher than 1%. So it means that for the Valencia province, the confidence, le uh, the confidence level is going to be set uh, at 63%. This big table shows an overall overview of the survey parameters that we need to introduce in, re in rivers to estimate the survey efforts. Uh, the target population survey parameters has been characterized in terms of the total number of inspection units, that is, uh, the total number of trees within the survey area, the epidemiological unit um, uh, extension, and the risk factor levels the relative risk and the proportion of the population in which this risk level applies. I would like to, to, to remark that in the survey design, we will consider a convenient sampling scheme with the objective to inspect and sample twice as many lemons and late mature sweet cultivars as the rest of the citrus species. As I mentioned before, we said that um, method sensitivity at 0 0.8, and we assume that we have to sample 50 asymptomatic and asymptom 50 asymptomatic and as asymptomatic fruits for each inspected tree. The rationing behind this number is detailed in the specific guidelines for C3 cap. The confidence level and the design prevalence are set axis at 63% and 1% respectively. So, after the introduction of the survey parameters numbers in the tool, the tool will give us an estimate of the survey efforts. Specifically, a, a rivers give us an estimate of the total survey efforts and also information uh, of the achieved confidence level. Remember that we set the confidence level at 63%. And 
and at the end we have to inspect and sample uh, 95 citrus trees. Additionally, Rebus outputs this information about the distribution of the survey effort according to its risk factor level. And here you can observe that assuming the sampling of 50 mature trees per tree, this um, survey force can be translated to the number of trees that, uh, that, that we have to, to collect. After the survey design comes the survey implementation. Once the, the trees have been inspected and matter of trees has been sampled and tested, according to the lab results, we can conclude about the survey. For this specific example that we uh, have managed during this webinar, uh, the survey conclusion can be formulated as Assuming that the Valencia province, the epidemiology of philostic taxicarpa is similar, after implementing the detection survey and sulla the, the samples test negative, it can, it can be concluded that with an overall confidence of 63%, if philostic uh, taxicarpa is present, the number of infected, three, uh, infected citrus tree is below 1%. On the contrary, if you find the best uh, in your laboratory, testing, you cannot state that the Valencia province is free from philosticta citrica. Uh, to conclude this webinar, we want to share with you a tutorial video on how to use Reeves tool. It's a very interesting video and you need to will be able to see how you can manage the introduction of the survey parameters and how the survey for outputs are so with are so within the platform. So it's time to enjoy the, the video. This video will demonstrate how to use the main functions of the Rebus tool and focus on first how to calculate the sample size of your survey, then how to include risk factors and convenient sampling, and third how to calculate the confidence level of a survey that has already been carried out. So let's get started. Rebus is a free online tool and can be accessed using any web browser. For this video, we're using Google Chrome. To go to the Rebus tool, you can type in the website address in the address bar or just search EFSA Rebus from any online search engine. If you're new to Rebus and want to access the tool for the first time, you need to register as a user by clicking here. The registration process is easy to complete and takes only a few minutes. You will then be able to log in with your email address and password to use the Rebus tool. After signing in, and once you've selected the Rebus tool, you can see the default view of Rebus. From the drop-down menu here, you can now choose what would you like to estimate? Let's start with calculating the sample size of a survey. To calculate the sample size, it's necessary to set the survey parameters as inputs for the tool. The minimum information required is the desired confidence level, the design prevalence of the survey, the size of the target population, and the method sensitivity. Let's try to fill in these parameters using an example. Let's say we want to carry out a survey and our population size is 10,000, our target confidence level is 95% with a design prevalence of 1% and the combined method sensitivity is 75%. When we now click on submit, the tool will automatically calculate the sample size, which in this case is 393. So in conclusion for such a survey, we can say that if you sample 393 plants out of the total 10,000, and if they all test negative, you will be 95% confident that if the pest is present, the true prevalence is less than 1%, given that the detection method, combining sampling and testing, can detect an infected sample 75% of the time. Rebus also allows you to introduce risk factors to the calculation. This can be done from the Risk Factors tab here. 
Then there are some additional parameters you need to insert into the tool. First, you can select the number of risk factors in the survey area. You should also be able to estimate the number of risk levels for each risk factor, as well as the relative risk of the risk levels and the proportion of the target population to which the relative risk applies. Let's try an example. We can continue with the same survey parameters that we have already inserted. In this example, we have one risk factor, which is the distance from a risk location. It is possible to name the risk factor accordingly. We can now choose the number of risk levels for the risk factor. In this case, we'll consider three levels, high risk, medium risk, and our baseline. The relative risk for the high risk level is three times higher than the baseline risk. For the medium risk level, it is twice as high. So we can insert three, two, and one here. The proportion of the whole population with high risk is 10%, with medium risk, 30%. The last proportion of the risk levels, which in our case is the baseline, can be inserted manually or by pressing complete risk proportions. Now we can press submit. By introducing a risk factor into the calculation, the total sample size has now dropped from 393 to 361. And these samples have been divided between the three risk levels. The group sensitivity in this case for each risk level is about 63%, which combined will give the overall confidence of 95% that we wanted to achieve. It's also possible to knowingly allocate more or less survey effort risk levels. In Rebus, this can be done using the convenient sampling functionality. Let's say we want to allocate twice as much sampling effort to the high risk level compared to the baseline. From the results, we see that focusing more on the population with high risk level further reduced the total sample size to 256. With this approach, we get a higher confidence in some risk levels and lower in others to achieve the desired target confidence of 95%. Now let's take a look at how to calculate the confidence level of a survey that has already been implemented. First, we need to choose global and group sensitivity from the drop-down menu here. Let's try an example. We can again use the same survey parameters as before. Population size 10,000, method sensitivity 75% and design prevalence 1%. Now let's say we've carried out the survey and taken 100 samples. We can see that while using our survey parameters, sampling 100 trees corresponds to 53% confidence. If we now introduce risk factors as before, and let's say we took twice as many samples from the population with high risk level than from the medium risk level or baseline, we can see that sampling 100 trees now corresponds to 68% confidence instead of 53. And that concludes this tutorial video. For further information, you can find the manual for Rebus here. We hope you found this video useful. Thank you very much for watching. So I hope that the video has helped you to consolidate all the contents that we have explained it, uh, during this webinar. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, now it's time to share with us your question um, and doubt. I, I have, we have one case, question about how the relative risk for Thelostic Drastic Tricarpa, I understand, has been set. So, this relative risk for, um, for citrus species and cultivars uh, has been set based on scientific le literature and expert assess assessment. But they are the base on the fact that, the, for instance, the relative risk um, uh, associated with lemons are based in the fact that the lemon trees uh, have several flowing, flowings during the year. So lemons have more chances to be infected 
than the other species. On the other hand, on the other hand, relative risk level the, that has been set for late maturing cultivars of seeds or sweet orange has been based on the fact that a late maturing cultivars have more time for system, for symptom expressions than the other ones. But even if you can add something. Yes. But um, the, the, so the, this uh, scenario that was uh, uh, presented by uh, Elena was mainly uh, targeting as uh, was mainly looking as uh, at the species uh, susceptibility the host plant species susceptibility to uh, to the fungus but there are other types of risk factors that can be considered and uh, um, in particular we can think of uh, 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 risk um, the risk of introduction can be can be uh, maybe can be used as a risk factor. So there are some areas where we have a higher risk of of uh, a pest to be introduced, and and this can be in fact uh, also captured and integrated in the simulations uh, in the in the survey design that is performed with the Ribes. We, so we could distinguish different types of locations with different types of risk depending on the 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 the, the volume of of uh, of uh, consignments that transit through the, the, the different uh, locations. But as well, we could uh, think of a relative risk uh, that is different depending on the distance from the risk location. That's another type of risk factor. And, and this could be linked directly to the capacity of spread of the pest. So there are means to quantify this. There are different types of examples that are used and, and uh, shown in the different pest survey cards and uh, story maps. And uh, I invite you to uh, go to the guideline documents where these information are used and processed in, in, in the calculation of a survey effort, but as well to consult the pest survey cards where a lot of different examples are proposed on this. So. No more questions. So, Gibran, if you... Yes, there are, there are further questions, but they up. will be addressed uh, in writing to the different uh, uh, persons. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, quickly uh, uh, wrap up on the different uh, elements that have been presented today. So first of all, we have, we have seen that a minimum set of data is required if we want to do a statistically based survey. And uh, this data has to be gathered, and there are some tools for gathering the, uh, that we are providing with some recommendations on how to gather the data, what type of data have to be used. Then there, is, uh, also, there was also uh, uh, an explanation on how to set the survey parameters. And um, the survey parameters, uh, uh, they need the involvement. Uh, to set them, they need the involvement of different types of persons, different types of experts. Um, it should include in the setting of the survey parameters the, the expertise of the inspectors that have a good knowledge of the area where the survey is conducted, of the laboratory technicians that know very well the methods that have to be uh, used for the identification of the pest or for the diagnostics in the laboratory of the pest, the risk managers that have to set the, uh, the, the, that are the key players in setting the proxy of zero, what is the acceptable le level of the pest we want to live with, and the scientists that can uh, support the different uh, uh, experts in this setting of the surveillance, uh, of the surveillance parameters. Um, so what we have shown is that using the approach, uh, we, can, uh, we can go as far as harmonizing a pest status, but we can mainly design robust uh, surveys that can may, that can uh, that are meant to reassure trade partners and they constitute uh, the robust surveys they constitute an evidence for pest freedoms and and this is something very important that can really uh, be uh, uh, used uh, in the future so basically this was a wrap up on on the discussions we have had i wanted also to uh, briefly explain what is coming next and uh, so our mandate uh, on, on pest surveillance in EFSA has been uh, extended and uh, we have been requested by the European Commission to address uh, more than 200 pests in the next six years. In particular, we are talking of the, quarant the quarantine pests, the union quarantine pests. 
protected zone pests and also emerging pests. We have also be, been asked to reflect on, the, uh, on how to optimize the surveillance, uh, the, the surveillance inspections and the surveillance activity uh, at the crop level. So how to uh, improve and, and, and uh, save uh, uh, resources when we uh, go for uh, crop-based surveillance, looking at different uh, pests at the same time, how to optimize the visits. We have also been uh, requested to uh, provide uh, a, a reshape of the current uh, Ribes tool. The Ribes tool that was uh, presented in the tutorial, uh, we want to uh, totally tailor it to the plant health requirements and uh, to make it a useful tool for the survey and for the reporting of the survey designs. Also, uh, uh, I wanted to mention that in the 1st of December, we will have a third webinar of the series of three, the last webinar, and that will be uh, focusing on the delimiting surveys. I hope that uh, you have enjoyed uh, this uh, webinar, and uh, uh, I really want to thank you for attending, and uh, I would all like to take the opportunity to thank the EFSA Working Group on Pest Surveys, all the staff, the experts involved, the tasking grants, the collaboration we have with member states on this, and also uh, different uh, the, the contractor ORTA. Um, want to thank also the technical support that we have received during the preparation of this webinar. Um, in case you would like to have further, uh, you, you would like to have further clarifications on the contents that have been provided today, feel free to uh, contact us at the following mailbox. Uh, Please uh, uh, be aware that in the context of the International Year of uh, Plant Health, we have also developed a website, a specific website that I invite you to visit, where you can find not only the pest survey uh, description of the pest survey activities, but also the other activities that uh, EFSA is conducting in the field of plant health. So thanks again to everybody, and uh, it was a pleasure to share this information with you. Thank you, Elena. Also. Thank you very much for all the attendees.